And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and if there's one thing that we all can agree on, it's that Inside Out is one of the greatest Pixar movies ever to come out. Well, maybe we won't agree on that, but if you disagree with me on that, you are wrong. Inside Out is a great movie. Another thing that I think we should all agree on is here that Mind Clash Games knows how to make unique, interesting themes. No trading in the Mediterranean, no roll and write, no zombies or generic fantasy, but something interesting. So here we have Cerebria, the inside world, which is kind of like Inside Out, the movie. A little, little more, you know, we got some negative bad evil emotions here. And you're competing back and forth. This is for two or four players as you compete to get the most points. So either Gloom will win or Bliss. And that's what this is. And that theme really had me interested. Not to mention the last game I played from these guys, Anachrony, has, is rapidly becoming one of my favorite games of all time. And it is, there's a lot going on in this game. When I open up this one, there's a lot going on in this one also. Let's take a look. Now realize that I'm just going to kind of give you an overview here. I'm not giving you all the rules to play this game because there really is a lot going on. But the game is going to be two or four players, and those players are going to be picking characters. You're going to be playing the negative emotions, I guess, like misery against harmony and delight and hatred and anxiety and malice and empathy and love. So you're going to play one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, -two, and you're going to get these boards. There's an A side to the board where they're all pretty much the exact same, and then a B side where you'll have difference, uh, differences on how these work. So players are going to have these. The goal of the game is to get the most points. Points. There's little wheels up here. If someone reaches 20, the game will end. And at the end of the game, there's going to be this tower that's being built in the middle. And the size of your pieces are going to give you points. Like the big one's going to give you five. The small ones will give you three. And whoever puts on the top piece, that piece is an additional four points. So it will get a little higher than that. And then you're also going to get points for meeting these aspirations. There's common ones that all players can do. And then you'll have your own hidden one that you are just trying to do. Uh, like, for example, here, have more adjacent emotions. If we pull that off, we'll be able to score that. And various other things that you'll be able to score with your own board. We have the Bliss versus Gloom here. Now, each player is going to have a deck of cards. So you're going to start with some emotions on the board two brightnesses and two bleaknesses, uh, but each player has their own cards. The cards, you'll see these have a little moon on them. There's another deck that doesn't, and you can pick a starting deck, or you can pick anything you want, really, and you're going to make a deck. You'll notice there's different types here, and they have a, a certain amount of control that they'll have on the board and special abilities, and even over the course of the game, you will be able to upgrade them into bigger and worse emotions, and so... That's kind of the goal because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be trying to control various areas on the board. One of these areas is called realms. So the realms are here. Uh, you can see this one here. The gloom side controls it, although if the switches, we just turn that over to see who controls it. They control because they have a bleakness with a control of one here. However, let's say maybe courage showed up over here and then the marker moves over to the number two spot. Then now bliss would control this side because courage would beat out bleakness. So these are realms. You also have frontiers. Frontiers are going to be on these lines here. They're usually matched up in the very middle. There's a spinning wheel. And so they're going to be controlled by these three cards rather than the other two cards. And so players are going to be going back and forth trying to control these different areas because that's a lot of the way the aspirations are scored, but it also gives you more options as the game goes by. Player is going to be taking turns uh, doing actions with their spirit, and they're going to be using uh, vibe tokens here to keep track of which of your actions. So at the beginning, you'll start with four of your actions unlocked, and as time goes by, you'll be adding more spirit tokens that to be different colors in each of the, the, the lines to make your action more powerful, or in the case of the last one, basically just making it cheaper. Remembering, of course, that on the B side of the board, there's going to be various weird weirder actions. I won't be going through all those at all. But these actions are going to be allowing your spirits to be able to do things and move around the board because your spirits are going to be starting here and moving around these spaces, accomplishing the goals to help you win the game. 
So on a player's turn, they're going to be able to use one of these actions that they have, but before they do that, they can discard a card from their hand and place a vibe token that matches this on an action to make that action better. Of course, you're giving up that card, doing other things with that. So we have these different actions. We have the move, which is going to let you move around the board. And so and you're going to notice that there's costs here, although you can make it uh, less of a cost to move around the board. Are are you able to move through other people? Are you able to move quickly? There's invoke emotions. This is how you're going to get more emotions on the game board. Maybe I want to put craving out on the game board. Hmm, I'm craving some key lime pie. Well, that's a negative emotion. Anyway, um, and so to be able to place these out on the board, you're going to be using willpower. That's the cost of this game, by the way. You have this willpower that you'll be using and getting more of, and this is how you're going to be doing the different actions that you can pull off. Players are going to be taking actions to move these tokens and make them better, or to even quell them, to get rid of the opponent's actions and get them off the board. Remember, you're starting with a couple bleakness and brightness on the board, depending on what team you are, but I'd much rather have dislike and loneliness and boredom and pes pessimism and jealousy and embarrassment on the board, or like I I said upgrade your things like the good guys can upgrade to passion and benevolence and valor and and uh, euphoria and serenity and hope and oh, man these are just these are much better cards you'll notice that their numbers also increase as you have them on the board players are also going to have the ability to fortify to place uh, things on the board and you build these forts and this is one of the ways to get things into the middle and add them here. You're going to be needing to move around to the different locations but there's just that constant keeping up with these actions. So you want to keep track of the actions you have here. The move, invoke, quell, fortify, empower. You have these actions that you can take and they're going to cost different amounts of these crystals. Now you're going to get these crystals by absorbing. There's an absorb ability here. You can use it once each turn before or after your action. You have to be next to it where you're going to be absorbing uh, crystals from here. This is also going to be making this move around here. This is going to be giving you special ability. You're going to be able to absorb some willpower and sometimes a revelation will happen and the way that's going to work is it's also going to determine whether you can score one of these cards for yourself or score one of the common ones that anybody can score out in the middle of the board. And again, I'm not going through everything. I'm just trying to give you an idea. So you're going to be coming in here to get these because you're going to need to use these to do things. You also have special ones that you can do. These can be done, the realm abilities can be done from anywhere on the board. You don't have to be in there, but if you're the person who controls it, you have a benefit. So for uh, it's a little bit cheaper. So for example, the Willow of Senses here will allow you to move over one of these tokens by paying a crystal. If I control that, then it's a little bit cheaper for me. So having these controls by putting out fortifications and putting out the different cards is really important because that's also kind of how a lot of these cards done, have the most intense emotion on the board, have more adjacent emotions on the board, control more opposite realm frontier pairs, have more different vibes on emotions, have more total intensity from fortresses, control more realms. It's constantly having more area control on the board. I haven't even mentioned yet there's ambition tokens where the players will be putting these ambition tokens here and being able to use those for actions on your turn too. So players are essentially just going to keep doing this until the last common aspiration is scored or a team would score a minor or major fragment on their turn but they don't have any remaining in which case then that team so let's say blue is ready to score and they need to put out another major one here and they have all their major ones on the board already so then they just put this on and that's going to end the game of course blue's probably going to win at this point and then you just do final scoring or if someone gets to 20 points and that's kind of it uh, again that's kind of a brief overview but what you're trying to do is control the different realms and the different areas on the board so that you can score these aspirations and do various other things that will get you points well, I don't think you're going to find anybody who thinks the artwork for this game is bad. This is just great artwork. These cards are super high quality. There's all kinds. I mean, look how kind and nice these people look. And, oh, well, look at these sludgy-looking guys. Fear and insecurity and disgust and boredom and craving and guilt and hostility and selfishness and pessimism. And all that. There's, there's symbols on these, too. It shows what it upgrades to. This pessimism will upgrade to despair. So if I'm upgrading the card... 
I'll just pull this over here, and here's the spare, which comes from pessimism. And these symbols down here, you'll probably have to look a lot of them up in a book, but after you play with them for a while, you'll get them. This is a really cool, neat thing, the tower, the pieces here. These crystals work well. This board here, since there's a little plastic piece that holds this in place, and lets it sit on top of that and then just rotate around. Uh, let me get it on there properly. There you go. And it just spins around very easily. There's a lot of pieces with the game. Like I said, there's a little moon marker on some of the cards so you can tell which cards are which. These are the upgraded cards, which is why they have that arrow on them. There is a lot of symbology. You're not going to be able to figure this out on your own thing. But the whole thing does have a really nice look to it. And I don't even have the upgraded version. I heard that the Kickstarter that there's painted miniatures. Here you have these standees, which are pretty cool. I mean, they show the artwork and everything. And I think they look pretty neat. So overall, just a really amazing looking game. Okay, so first, very clearly, great components, amazing. The whole orange blue motif, the whole thing looks great. When we're playing in public, people come by like, what are you doing? And you're like, it's inside out the board game, which isn't quite true, but close enough, right? People understand the theming of this and kudo and major points for this cool theme. Like I said, they've always done a good job making games about rain clouds, raining and, and uh, illusionists, magicians and Anachrony with time travel. Now we got this. Fantastic. It is a big giant box and it is a fairly heavy box. And again, that's something that they've done a lot, you know, with their past games. And there's a lot going on in this game. Now, let's start with a couple things. First of all, I'm not convinced this is a four player game. Yes, you can play four players and each person controls their own emotion, has their own deck, and you work back and forth. But because so much of the game is open, this game is really open to this one person saying, you should do this, 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 and on your turn. And you're going, I don't want to do that, but that is the best move. Very easily, I, I, I don't see that the four-player game, the partnership thing, offers anything over a two-player game. When I first played a four-player game, I was like, ah, I don't know. I played a two-player game and I said, oh. Well, this is the way the game was meant to be played. It just seems that way. Yes, you can play four-player game just like you can play almost any two-player game, four-player game, by giving someone half of it. It's not quite the same thing here, but definitely felt that way to me. The game is one of essentially area control. The whole game is about area control. There's a bit of a deck building and a little bit of hand management as you get these cards, but it's about playing the cards out in areas and using your actions to control these different realms and control different regions, and there's a lot going on as you control things. And because of that, you will run into the small problem of placing a card on the board and saying, wait, okay, that changes this and this, or I put this out, that changes this. And it's not that bad. That's not a complaint on my end, but that is a little bit of the fiddliness of moving things around all the time. Again, that theme does come through pretty strongly, although I will say that the pessimist guy versus the optimist or the gloom and bliss, that didn't really see like the theming of their particular emotions necessarily came through. I think that the game is a wide open game and has a lot of great options. And it's well, I, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can build my deck. I mean, really, when you start off with it, it's overwhelming. And they're like, we recommend you start with these cards. And you're like, thank you, as you grasp at that like a drowning man. Because if you don't, you're like, what cards do I put in my deck? And the simple truth is you can do anything you want. You can build a really cool deck, or at least a deck that you're going to like. And I, I think that's a good thing. And it, it's, But when you first play, definitely just put all the pieces and put everything where they tell you to put them. That just makes a lot more sense. But as time goes by, it gives you that option to branch out and each game's gonna feel different because of those emotions and negative things. So that's, that's very positive. There's a lot of cool things. There's different currencies going on. But here's why in the long run, it's not the kind of game that I'm interested in. Note, not saying it's a bad game. I'm just saying it's not the kind of game I'm as interested in. When a game is big and has a lot of pieces going on, I don't mind that. Uh, I know a lot of people think I'm opposed to big games with tons of pieces, but again, pointing out that the game that came out directly before this anachrony is even bigger and has more pieces, and I love it. So it's not the size of the game or the number of rules. Where I tend to, on a personal level, pull back from a game is when there is a ton of rules, and there's not even a ton of rules, but a lot going on in the game and yet, 
it feels like a small payoff. If you notice, the winning team is the first to get to 20, or 20 ends the game anyway. So 20 points is a lot of points. And you have these aspirations, these common ones and minor ones, and it's all about fulfilling that. So I'm like, I'm doing this and doing that. I'm over here, we're controlling this. I'm playing this card here, I'm doing that. To control this, and we get a point. And you say, well, yeah, that's the whole point of the game. Yeah, but for me, that just feels a lot of unsatisfying. I feel like I moved a lot of pieces and did a whole lot of things for a very small payoff. And that's how this game feels to me. It feels like the, the payoff of excitement is not as strong as the, ooh, look, I put, out, I put out this cool emotion, and I'm upgrading this, and I moved over here, and I took some stuff, and I rotated the thing here, and I used ambition, I did these cool moves, and now, oh, look, now we're scoring, and we scored our private ambition, yay, and we get to put a piece in the tower, and that's all cool and satisfying, but doesn't feel like enough for me in effort to all the work that I have done to get to that point. Not to mention, because there's all these realms, and you have five realms, and I think there's ten different areas that you're controlling at any given point, and then there's, you know, people themselves are blocking the board, it feels like you're looking at all this stuff, and you're looking at the cards in your hand, which can be used in multiple ways, and I'm thinking about the upgraded cards that I can go to, and so there's a lot of stuff, a lot of levels, and the fun of the game for me doesn't equal those levels. I get it. I get how the game plays. Not to mention, I would argue that unless you're playing a close game, I feel like a uh, good three-fourths in, you're going to know who's going to win. It's Sometimes, it's if one team gets ahead and they control some areas, it's really hard for you to bust out of those areas. Or if someone scores two cards and you score none when the aspirations are scored, and you're like, oh, okay, we're behind. And if that happens a couple times in a row, it can be hard to dig yourself out of that hole. I don't think the game is too long. It says two hours. Two hours seems right. I think the theme is great. The components are great. I think there's a lot of great ideas, and the variety is great. And I'm not giving this a negative review. I'm giving this a mediocre review, but mostly for me. I realize a lot of people are really going to like this one. I would argue it still feels very strongly like a two-player game. And for me, and a lot of folks that I played with, it felt like there was too many moving parts for it to really bring out that fun. I make fun of point salad a lot in games, where you do this, get some points, do that, and get some points. But you know what? I feel like in a bigger game, I want that. I want these little victories I get. And in this one, there was too many. Uh, I did a whole lot, and then I feel like it didn't pay off in the long run. But I have to applaud them. This is a great work, and I really feel like I will probably be in the minority. Some other people probably agree with me. Like maybe there's too much. I think that Mind Clash probably puts too much in their games. They, they need to shave off more, I think, as time goes by. And I think it shows it to me. It shows it even more in this one than some of the other ones. But what can you say? It's not a training in a Mediterranean game. I'm very pleased about that. You'll probably have to try this one out for yourself. But that's what I think about Cere Cerebria the inside world. Dice Tower Judgment, there's a lot going on uh, and there's a lot of neat things in this game. There's just maybe a little too much for me.